I'm Father Mitch Paqua, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we'll take a look at the way that Christianity responded to the Enlightenment movement of the 18th century and the subsequent anti-Christian legacy of the French Revolution and even Napoleonic reign and how we can use lessons learned from that period of time to stand up to the contemporary secularism that is threatening our Catholic faith today. Before we get to that, we would like to talk briefly with EWTN Radio's Jack Williams about what's new on EWTN Radio. Jack, what do you have for us? Well, I've got some exciting, exciting news yes. tonight to share with our viewers. Have you ever been to Chicago? Yes, sir. Once or twice? Uh-huh. <laughs> I wanted to be close to my mother when I was born. There you go. It's great. Well, we've got uh, Angela Tomlinson and a group of folks in the northern suburbs in Antioch, Illinois, have had a radio affiliate there that's carried EWTN programming for a long time, WSFI 88.5 uh -huh. FM. And Angela and her team have uh, undertaken a new venture where they are bringing EWTN programming to WNDZ 750 AM in Chicago, started back on the 11th on the Feast of Our Lady, and she, uh, she is now covering <coughs> the entire Chicago metro area, the entire Chicagoland area, uh, with EWTN programming Monday through Friday during the daylight hours. And uh, this covers parts of Gary, Indiana, southwest Michigan, southern Wisconsin, and as I said, the entire Chicago metropolitan area, and that is quite uh, a feat for her to pull off, and uh, we're very excited to now be speaking on Wednesdays, on Open Line Wednesday, with Father Mitch. They're going to be hearing you in your home and native land, Chicagoland. Ain't that something? <laughs> it's a big, it's a big, it's a big well, deal for us. We're very excited about it. Since it reaches Western Michigan, I have to get my kid brother to start listening. I bet in he his, can hear it in, in South Haven. Shop. Yeah, I bet he can hear it up uh, there in South he's Haven. Got a mechanic it shop is. over there, so well, yeah, yeah I bet he can. It's just yeah. right across the lake. So this, you know, we've got over 350 of these affiliated stations around mm -hmm. the United States now. And if anybody's in an area where they can't hear EWTN radio on an AM or FM station, uh, all they need to do is contact Steve Splonskowski. And you don't have to worry about how to spell Splonskowski because they've got a really easy email address for you to reach Steve. That's radio at EWTN.com. So email Steve at radio at EWTN.com. If you do not have AM, FM radio uh, from EWTN in your area and you think you might maybe like to try to play a part in making that happen, we can help you out. And until then, they can get the EWTN radio app. Exactly right. And listen on the Sirius app. XM channel 130, EWTN.com, the EWTN app, iHeartRadio, all of your major platforms you can find EWTN radio. Cool. Well, thanks, awesome. Jack. Thank you, Father Mitch. Yeah, then Howdy to everybody in Sweet Home Chicago. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Please stay with us, and we'll get to tonight's guest. Welcome back. Our guest tonight is a Catholic historian who thinks the 18th century Enlightenment movement deserves a fresh examination from a more balanced perspective than I usually have. I usually go for antagonism towards the Enlightenment, but he's going to be much more balanced, and he suggests that there were three strategies used by Christians in the Enlightenment. The first was conflict, my favorite, engagement, and retreat. And he also says that for different circumstances, 
they can apply and be used by us in the contemporary anti-Christian culture as well. So please welcome the author of a book called Rethinking the Enlightenment, Faith in the Age of Reason, Dr. Joseph T. Stewart. Dr. Stewart, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a delight. It's a delight to have you here with us. And um, here's a, a, a one basic question that I want to, to start off with. What is the Enlightenment movement, and when did it start? Sure. Well, it, it starts really about 1700, lasts throughout the 1700s, so about 100 years mm -hmm. time period we would give it. And uh, it was just an exciting time in many ways of uh, enthusiasm for the physical sciences, yep. for technology, and for, I think we could say, a kind of optimism that human beings can improve their lives in the world. And, and for much of history, people just kind of accepted daily life as it was. But in the Enlightenment, people began to think about ways that they could really improve themselves in the world. And But I think it's sometimes best to think of the Enlightenment not so much as a set of philosophical conclusions, but more as a method, sort of a way of approaching the world according to the centrality of the human that could be used in either a theistic way or an atheistic way. And there were people certainly on both sides of that. But to think about the Enlightenment more as a, as a way of approaching the world rather than just sort of a, a set of conclusions, I think is, is really helpful. Uh, th I think that's a, a good point. And, and for many people in the Enlightenment, reason was the touchstone. The ability to use logic and reason as the starting point. In some ways, that was what Rene Descartes had started off with um, uh, a few decades earlier. And you know, this, this idea that um, using reason to understand physics the way Sir Isaac Newton had done and Galileo even earlier than he. Um, you know, just observation and drawing logical conclusions on the basis of observation. This was part of that mentality. And we still have it. It's not a bad idea, is it? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And I think, yeah, reason would be a key touchstone of the, of the Age of Enlightenment, um, but so too would liberty, particularly political liberty, and what we could call the, the Enlightenment more in its American mode. Um, and then virtue, and the importance of virtue for society and social order was a key touchstone of the Enlightenment in Britain. So you have kind of different flavors uh, of the Enlightenment, and so sometimes it's, again, it's, it's helpful to think of mo almost multiple Enlightenments. They, they share a kind of methodology, like I said, like a, the privileging of the human, but you, you get sort of local varieties of it. Now, uh, one of the things that also is of interest, in the Middle Ages, nobody said, I belong to the Middle Ages. <laughs> right. And, you know, <laughs> when you are, you, usually, when you are in the middle of something, you are not aware of what that period of history will be called. That's Did right. the Enlightenment people see themselves as the Enlightenment? Yeah, they did. Yeah, it was the, it was the kind of the Renaissance actually that had created the idea of the Middle Ages, uh, of a middle time between the ancient classical world and the revival of classical learning in the in the time of the Renaissance. And the Enlightenment sort of picked up on that theme, um, gave it maybe a little bit darker hue, uh, and, and started calling it the the Dark Ages or that thousand years. Um, because of the lack of, of learning, primarily, and the mm -hmm. kind of barbarism that they thought was really prevalent in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Um, and so, but they did realize that they themselves were living in a different age in which they really respected the classical world, but for the first time they're realizing that, well, Aristotle made mistakes, at least in his, in his, in his uh, physical science. Mm -hmm. And so we actually need to go beyond what Aristotle and some of the classics had done. We need to go beyond them. And so we have the yeah. New Age. Yeah, yeah, that was um, part of the tension, I, I think, for a lot of people in the church who had studied Aristotle's philosophy, 
That's right. But they, they assume that his physics and other, his biology and other science elements were true, and so they kept deducing from Aristotle that yes. this is the way the world really is because Aristotle was so good at logic and ethics and other areas of philosophy. And, you know, they found out that, well, no, at least you said, he needed to have a lot of improvements. That's why Sir Isaac Newton and others did more work in physics, astronomy, other areas. Yeah, that's right, because it came as a shock that Aristotle made mistakes because <laughs> he was held as yeah. a high platform yeah. for so long, you know. Yeah. And so people realize, whoa, like if, if he made certain mistakes, then I wonder what other other things the ancient world didn't see. Well, of course, one of the things they didn't see was the Americas that had been discovered. And so there was new geographical information that was coming into Europe that had never, never been dreamed of before by the classical world. And so this was a really kind of exciting, you know, discovery of the world, uh, really for the first first time. Yeah. And uh, there was lots and lots of exploration to be done throughout the, the uh, world because Africa was also discovered to be much larger than North Africa and so on. It just was a wide, wide variety of uh, discovery. Now, yeah, that's right. why was there tension between this enlightenment in the church. Sounds like their dispute is with Aristotle. How did the church get in on this? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. Well, I mean, the the dispute was was mainly in France. Well, I think it's good to good to start there. Um, the, the the French had a unique culture in the sense they had a very great king, a series of kings, absolute mm -hmm. monarchs. Uh, who were um, at least officially very Catholic, sons of the church, that's for sure. And, um, but the, the trouble was is that the, the, the regime in France was sometimes quite repressive of, of, of people who were um, either not Christian or other Christians like Protestants. And, um, and then the regime became even, even repressive of different kinds of Catholics. So you, you had uh, the Jansenists, for example, who were who be persecuted, and you had to you had to be a certain kind of uh, official Catholic. That's uh, sort of a political correctness that we think of today. You got to be a certain kind of way of thinking, right? Well, a similar kind of Catholic political correctness was at work in in France, and it just it created a kind of resentment beneath the surface of the culture. I think mm -hmm. that people like Voltaire uh, and Diderot and these some of these Enlightenment figures who really like attacked the church. Um, one of the reasons they did that was because they saw a lot of abuse of power. The church was connected to the state, and so whenever there's an abuse of power by the state, the church was implicated. And so that kind of put a bad flavor in a lot of um, people's mouths, both within France, these Enlightenment figures, and some, a lot of these Protestants, like Pierre Bale, who had fled France and then were writing about how, how the situation in France, it kind of created a, a poisonous atmosphere, has really tainted the reputation of the whole Enlightenment. And, you know, certainly it's worth noting that in the century before the Enlightenment, during the uh, uh, 1600s, uh, it was a French cardinal, Richelieu, who had so much power in France, and not always for the sake of Christ, the Church, or the Gospel. He was in many ways, more of a Frenchman than he was a Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so many of his policies that came out, but he was associated with some of that o oppression uh, with inside France, as well as being one of the puppeteers in the Thirty Years' War. And mm -hmm. Enlightenment people objected to religion being a basis for war. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, just like today, you can, we can see in the in the sad scandals in our, within our own church. Whenever there's an abuse of power mm -hmm. of a, somebody who has a, a respected position of should be charitable and th then you get you get a reaction. You you see people who not only are trying to like run away from the church, but you have people who then are attacking the church, and you know that's sad. They they, they shouldn't necessarily be doing that, but you can maybe start to understand why when we look at what's going on beneath the surface. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, you know, it, it's a different motivation in contemporary times. Um, 
uh, a lot of the, the so-called uh, secular or progressive left and various other names they give themselves would see the church as opposing some of their own pet projects like uh, issues about life, uh, yeah. beginning of life, end of life, quality of life, all those things they see and the church is in opposition to their agendas. So yeah. this is another uh, factor in modern times. Now, mm -hmm. here's the question. You mentioned France, but was the antagonism to the church universal in Europe? Did, uh, no, all the Enlightenment, no, did, did all the Enlightenment figures in, say, Italy and Germany and other places, did they always have this kind of um, antagonistic relationship with the church? No, definitely not. There, there were many, many we call them enlighteners or, or people of the enlightenment, yeah, very you know, thinkers and leaders mm -hmm. uh, who, who were Catholic, who were very deep Catholics. And we can, we'll talk about some of them here tonight for sure. Um, but also uh, Protestant Christians and, and Jewish people who were, you know, very religious, but also very sort of enlightened, you know, we could call. And so there, there's a, there's a whole different side to the, to the age of the enlightenment that's been um, forgotten for many, mm -hmm. for different reasons. Uh, and, and so what this book, is, is doing is trying to build on uh, recent scholarship since about the year 2000, uh, Father. There's been a lot of historical work done on the 18th century by uh, many just wonderful historians, many of them American, but European as well, and, and outside that, recovering this story of Christian participation mm -hmm. in the Enlightenment. And my mm -hmm. book, these, I mean, these scholars are much greater scholars than I am, so my book is for a general audience trying to draw from their work to make it available. Yeah. See, that's one of the things I, I liked about your book and I found very helpful. Most of the time we study the 1700s in order to see how some of those thinkers from the Enlightenment affected the American revolutionaries. Yeah. And we also study how the French Revolution went badly compared to ours, especially and how the Napoleonic Wars came out of it. And, and when, frankly, when you're teaching history classes, being able to study about war and violence keeps the class more interesting. But the history of ideas is not always as exciting, especially if you're teaching high school um, and grammar school. So, yeah, I think you're right that this is a new evaluation. So. Explain to us these three approaches that you describe in your book so nicely. Sure. Um, the, sure. the, the, the three different approaches. Start off with the antagonism. Okay. Yeah. Well, first, first, let me back up just a little bit and say okay. that I'm just I'm somebody really interested in the relationship between Catholicism and the modern world, and and how that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Modern world being defined by so basically since 1500 till till today. Mm -hmm. All right. So my question often is with my students too, you know, is, is to what extent we can we be Catholic and modern to have a kind of a bicultural identity? How, how far, what does that look like? And so I started to realize that um, the modern world really started to come together in the 1700s during the age of the enlightenment. And so what if we use the age of enlightenment as sort of a, a smaller case study in this larger question of Catholicism in the modern world? Mm -hmm. If we could look at the 1700s, the age of the Enlightenment, when many of our modern ideals came about, and we understand how Christians engaged with that time, then that will shed light on that on that larger question. So that's okay. that's the background to what I'm trying to do. Okay, so you you really are trying to help us as contemporary Catholics that's deal right. with the ongoing struggle with yeah. the ideas that began in the Enlightenment. Yep. And still show up today in various conflicts. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the challenges to doing this work, Father, has been that um, many of the sort of old school uh, views of the Enlightenment are what you were saying before, is that for Catholics, it was bad because it attacked the church. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that Catholics have long time thought that is because of the French Revolution and sort of remembering the Enlightenment through the French Revolution. But here's the problem, Father, that that assumes that the Enlightenment was only French. Yep. And that also assumes that the, the, that the French Enlightenment caused the French Revolution, which is, is a 
matter of some historical controversy, that connection between the actual Enlightenment and the French Revolution, because mm -hmm. there were many actual Enlightenment figures who were killed by the Revolution, and there were other ones outside France who were horrified by what was going on in the French Revolution. So mm -hmm. the Enlightenment was much bigger than just the French Revolution. But Catholics and actually many secular historians have remembered the Enlightenment through the French Revolution and then assumed that the Enlightenment was always opposed to religion. That narrative is what me and other historians have been challenging for the last 20 years. Yeah, great. And I, I think that that is, is correct. I, I, a lot of folks don't remember that the French Revolution itself developed in stages and that the earliest stages did not show the same antagonism as, say, once uh, folks like Rousseau have influence on the, the French uh, committee That's right. um, in That's Paris right. and, and caused the reign of terror on the basis of Rousseau's notions yeah. and Robespierre's, you know, megalomania, as it turns out. Um, so I think that's important to, to distinguish. So tell us then about, um, uh, well, we've been talking about the conflict Let's let's yeah. get make sure I want to make sure we get into the engagement again. The conflict is interesting because it's a good fight, and I always yeah. like that. And whether it's a Western movie or history, um, <laughs> let, let's let's get over to uh, the engagement. Where was their engagement between the yeah. church and the Enlightenment? Sure. Yeah. So. That's what I found was that there were these three strategies, not just the conflict, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the conflict. And so there are Christians in the 18th century, if we go back in time as a historian, which is what we do, and we look around and we say, okay, let's try to understand these people on their own terms. Yep. And what I saw was that there were three strategies that Christians used. I don't say they, were, they weren't necessarily self-conscious strategies, mm -hmm. right? They wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to pick this one today, right? But yeah. it was more that these were the, the kinds of responses that I was seeing Christians ma making. And one was this, this conflict that we've seen already, and we can, we can talk more about because there's some amazing stories connected to, to conflict soon. Um, but the second, engagement. So here's where the places where Catholics were engaging with Enlightenment themes, this kind of Enlightenment method that I mentioned at the beginning. They're engaging with that and then letting it reflect back on how they understand society and the church. The, the third strategy they used was just to kind of ignore uh, the Enlightenment and just kind of retreat, not in a military sense, but in a more of like a, a spiritual movement inward to try to build up Christian culture and its institutions from within, home, households, parishes, uh, religious, so religious societies, religious orders, um, etc. So the first conflict is sort of imagine two cultures that are sort of colliding with each other. And in engagement, imagine two cultures that are sort of overlapping. Mm -hmm. They share common, common concerns. And in retreat, imagine two cultures that are kind of parallel, developing through time, just kind of ignoring each other. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of ignoring each other. Yeah. And each strategy has its own strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that um, if, if we can understand what the strengths and weak weaknesses are of each strategy, we can see how we need all three because the strengths of one help to counterbalance the other. And I could so clearly see that in the context of the 18th century. And so I was excited to think about, OK, well, you know, today we also need different strategies and they need to correct each other's strengths and weaknesses as well. Yep. Now, in terms of engagement, what were some examples of that yeah. engagement with the Enlightenment yeah. and the church? Sure. Well, this is the whole subject of what's called the, the Catholic Enlightenment. And, and this might seem a, a bit of a shocking phrase to, to some people, putting those two words together. But um, there's, there's just dozens of books now on this, this topic the, called the Catholic Enlightenment. The, the term itself has been around for 100 years, but it's only been in the last 20 years that it's gotten a lot of attention from historians at, at major universities, uh, from Toronto to Notre Dame to Pennsylvania and outside our country as well, and realizing that, wow, there were sophisticated, very intelligent Catholic intellectuals, monks, bishops, lay people, women, we could talk about some of their amazing stories, and a pope, Pope Benedict XIV, mm -hmm. who's, who's called the, the Enlightenment Pope. Mm -hmm. uh, he reigned from 1740 to 1758. All of these people 
across Europe who just in some very inspiring and amazing ways were engaging with their enlightenment culture and, and helping to lay the basis for a, a kind of modern Catholicism that, that we kind of take for granted today since Vatican II. Um, much of the ground of Vatican II uh, was explored and developed by these Catholic Enlightenment figures, particularly in Germany, with various monks, um, but other ones too, uh, vernacular in the liturgy, for example, um, particip wide participation in the liturgy, um, you know, simplifying th things and uh, the importance of reason in the faith. These kinds of, of, of contemporary themes, uh, the Catholic Enlightenment was really developing uh, long before us. Yeah. Uh, it's not a Catholic uh, uh, approach exactly, but it, it is used by a lot of Catholics. When you look at even the music of the 18th century, you start to hear this very mathematical and precise type of music yeah. that we you know, associate with that period being used for, primarily for the churches. Yeah, Mozart, just Mozart is a great example of the Catholic yeah, Enlightenment. Exactly, exactly. Yep. And yep. that he wrote, uh, you know, very secular operas, but he also wrote absolutely stunningly beautiful masses. Yeah. And so it, it's, that, that, that's one area where it's meant to engage in the spiritual life of people, and that's it right. resonated. Yeah, that's right. One of the great texts of the Catholic Enlightenment uh, 1746 by Ludovico Motori, who is an Italian priest and archivist and archaeologist of sorts as well, historian. Uh, he's, he's known for the Muratorian fragment. He, he's the one yes. that discovered that, yes. uh, the, the oldest list of uh, New Testament books that we have in, on record. And, uh, and by the way, so, so, so folks understand, he discovered that uh, manuscript. It goes back to a list in the 180s A.D., yeah. I mean, it's just remarkable that he discovered that. Yeah, it's really incredible. Yeah, just a brilliant man. And he wrote a book that was translated and read all over Europe in just thousands and thousands of copies um, uh, called uh, Reasonableness in Devotion. Mm -hmm. And his idea was that we need to see the importance of reason for our, not just theology, but even our spiritual lives. Mm-hmm. In, you have a tendency in certain kinds of Catholics toward um, superficiality and um, superstition even, uh, maybe even scrupulosity and these mm -hmm. sorts of things. And he's seeing this and he's realizing, well, what, what we need is, is an education in, in reason so that people are deepening their faith and connecting it to other parts of their humanity, um, not sort of getting off into some of these tangents, which are kind of almost an excess of religion, uh, that, which is how uh, uh, superstition is defined. Um, and so what we need to is sort of balance with a, a deeper faith and reason in the very midst of our own spirituality. And this book was just a, a, a real bestseller, you could say, of the 18th century. Yeah. Well, look, we need to take a little break. Uh, we'll come back in uh, a couple of minutes. We're with Dr. Joseph Stewart from the University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota. And you can contact them by, go, by going to umary.edu. And we're discussing his book, Rethinking the Enlightenment, Faith in the Age of Reason. Uh, it's available at EWTN Religious Catalog. If you just go to EWTNRC.com, it's item number 8227. We'll be back in just a couple minutes, continue on this discussion, how dealing with the Enlightenment can help us understand how to deal with our own age. Right, so we are taking a look at the enlightenment of the 18th century and its relationship to Christian faith then and what we can learn about it. And 
Uh, one of the last areas I want to make sure that we just at least touch on before we go into some specifics is to th this retreat. You describe a, a third strategy besides the conflict that especially was true in France and then the uh, engagement with the Enlightenment such that we see in Germany and Italy. You also talk about a retreat. Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so here we turn to the English speaking world, uh, which would be mainly England, uh, Scotland and, and the colonies before they were independent in the United States. And uh, here, this is the place of the what, what what I call the practical enlightenment. So it was more an, an enlightenment of tradesmen and inventors like Benjamin Franklin and just real practical people uh, mm -hmm. who weren't at all trying to, you know, talk about high ideas, but they just wanted to make better ways to live. They wanted to have, get their streets paved and they wanted to have lights on in their cities and, and these kinds of things. So this and, is the, the practical enlightenment. It's in this period that you see the invention of the steam engine. That's right. And the, the beginning of That's right. the industrial revolution that comes from that. I mean, it was very much practical and economic. Uh, and and right. I'd say Adam Smith is part of that as well with his ideas of economy. That's right. Yeah, the kind of practical mindedness about human affairs, both in, in an engineering sense and also even in a political sense, sort of a, a practical mindedness in, in America. And we'll talk more about that later, the pol political side, but sort of a practicalness, not utopian dreaming, you know, about perfect governments or societies, but just like, how can we compromise to just create a, a tolerable order and freedom, you know, in our country. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the English speaking world. That's one of our virtues in, in the English speaking world. One of the good things about us, I think. And um, anyway, in, in the midst of this, this practical enlightenment, this industrial revolution that, that's going on, Christians, uh, many of them, to, to preserve their faith, were sort of practicing what I call a retreat. And again, it's not so much in a military sense, but a, a movement inward in which they're going to focus on building up the faith, starting within their, their souls and in their families, and then raiding out to their, their parishes and to their religious institutions mm -hmm. uh, around them. Mm -hmm. And so the, the image that I like to use for this is an 18th century term called householding, uh, which basically meant just sort of taking care of your household, both of the, the man and the woman. And now that included, of course, their children, but also a lot of times they had apprentices living with them or sometimes servants or relatives. And the household was the basic social and really even spiritual unit of society. Everybody's goal in the 18th century was to be in a household and very different than, than today. Marriage was something that was highly esteemed. And so nurturing life within these households, both in a material sense and a spiritual sense, nurturing life, trying to integrate faith into all aspects of life. That was a key of this retreat strategy. And what's really fascinating, Father, is that we can, we can take a look at, at certain families that we have enough of historical records uh, to study how that inward retreat then exploded outward to the rest of society in sort of a creative evangelical movement that, that spread religion, both in a Catholic and a Protestant sense, uh, across Europe. Yeah, it's um, an interesting phenomenon to look in the American colonies that about 10 years or so before the American Revolution, there was this great awakening, a spiritual revivalism that fed a good number of the American revolutionaries. That's and right. that that practical uh, revolution and practical governmental checks and balances and willingness to fight for one's freedom was in many ways motivated by that religious conversion. Yeah. And so they, they fed each other, but the, it came before that. And, uh, and you also see uh, that by the end of the 18th century in Catholicism, the greatest period of missionary work began. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. a whole new flourishing of orders. Uh, during the French Revolution, you had a decrease in priestly vocations and religious vocations, probably because mm -hmm. they were killed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'll stop you every time. 
But yeah, that's right. Uh, but it was only the second time of decline of religious uh, orders and priestly vocations, the mm -hmm. Reformation being the first. But as in both cases, afterwards there was this revitalization that yeah. went out to the world that everybody else was discovering. Yeah, that's right. But even within Europe, too, and even before the French Revolution, you have new orders like the Redemptorists yes. with Liguri in, in Italy, uh, which were growing by leaps and bounds. And they were they were oriented towards missionaries at home in the sense of our own European peoples yes. need to hear the gospel. And and also Louis de Montfort in, in France, yes. uh, his missionary, his company of Mary, founded in 1705, especially in the western part of France, were working all through the decades before the French Revolution, which is interesting, Father, because that's, of course, where the revolt of the Vendée happened in exactly. the western part of France against the French Revolution, partly because of this incredible missionary work that Louis de Montfort and his followers had done in the decades before. Yeah, that in the face of the, this is where we go back to the conflict, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that because you deal with some very interesting characters from that conflict. We've done a few programs about the, that Vendée uh, revolt, yeah. but though when the government of France tried to get rid of the priests and nuns and started executing them, and stopping them from celebrating Mass and locking the churches. Louis de Montfort's converts uh, to, to this revitalized Catholicism stood firm against mm -hmm. the revolution, and the, the French government in Paris saw to the killing and just slaughter, the first genocide in Europe's right. history. Well, it was. About a couple hundred thousand people were killed by their own government in the name of the secular enlightenment. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I visited a small town in western France, and there was a giant crucifix in the middle of the town. And I asked what that was for, and they said, well, it, it marks a mass burial grave of 1,200 people who were killed in this village during the revolt of the yeah. Vendée. Said, yeah. Wow. So it's, it's, wow. It, it, was, it was a horrible, horrible and, and if you check, uh, at, again, at EWTN's religious catalog, you can see we have some videos that were done about that revolt. But yeah. you don't focus quite as much on the Vendée revolt as you do on the French Carmelite sisters. Yeah. Tell yeah, us yeah, about the Carmelites. Them. Sure, the Carmelites of Compiègne, their story actually starts the book because it's so beautiful and so dramatic, and it brings us really into the, the heart of the conflict between Christianity and the Enlightenment, which I'll just define in three terms quick before telling their story. So the, the heart of that conflict has to do with religion, whether we even need it or not, and, and some right. in France thought we don't. Right. Um, the second part of conflict was uh, human nature. They would say it's not fallen, it's, it's, uh, it's perfect, and so we just need to rearrange the government so that we can then perfect human society. Well, that's an obvious conflict with original sin and, and, and Christianity. And then the third conflict was just over the nature of reason itself and whether reason is just sort of an individual faculty or whether we need other people, the community around us, like the church, to help us form our reason. And the, these conflictual enlighteners, I would say, uh, rejected all three of those all three of those points. Yeah. So this worked to undermine Catholicism. Oftentimes like to say that Rousseau, who rejected the doctrine of original sin, yeah. could only do that with that because he never raised a two-year-old. That's right. <laughs> he, ha he was the father of many children, but he was not married to their mothers, and he never bothered to raise them. Had he done so, he may have rethought uh, what yep. it means to have original sin. That's exactly right. He he dropped his kids off at the Foundling Hospital and said goodbye to them because he yep. was he was too busy writing books about how to raise kids. Uh, in, in meal, for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is super ironic. Yeah. So th yeah. this is but anyway. uh, the reality. So so how did this conflict then develop? Yeah. So okay. So the the French Revolutionary regime by about 1792 is becoming very hostile to the church, yep. was starting to close down religious orders, um, change the names of streets from saints to pagan classical figures. And these famous Carmelites of Compiègne, 16 nuns from a convent north of Paris aways, fell into the crosshairs of the government, uh, partly because 
they were continuing to live their religious life in hiding, but continuing even though it was illegal. So they got put on trial, and um, the, the date of their accusation uh, was July 16th, 1794, the, the feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And then uh, the next day, they were tr put on trial, uh, accused of uh, fanaticism, uh, which when they asked what, they, what the judge meant, he meant, well, basically it's because you're Catholic. <laughs> and they said, okay. They had a smile on their face at that point because they knew they were going to die as, as martyrs for sure. And so they were taken out. And what's amazing, Father, about this story is, you know, there were a lot of people killed at the guillotine in the French yes. Revolution, thousands and thousands. And normally they were brought to the to the guillotine in carts and the streets would be surrounded by people swearing and cursing and yelling and just very mean and throwing rotten vegetables. And But in this case, they were silent because these 16 nuns in their habits were singing through the streets of Paris, the Miserere, the Salve Regina, Vespers, singing in the beautiful words, in the praise of God, and asking for God's mercy, were sacred words that welled up from their hearts as much as from the very depths of Christian culture, which by this point was just a memory for so many people. It silenced the crowd. And these sisters went through the streets of Paris and were brought to the guillotine and began to um, renew their vows as they gathered around. The executioner gave them a little extra time as a community to, to pray together. And still silence. And no one had, I mean, this was un, unprecedented. No one had ever seen an entire religious community executed, executed like this before. And so Mother Superior then stood at the, the bottom of the steps and she called uh, Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, her, her name is, amazing woman. Uh, she called the youngest member forward first and um, they're, meanwhile, they're all singing. All the sisters are singing together. The youngest kneels down and kisses a statue of Mary in her hand. She stands up and then looks her mother superior in the eye and she says, permission to die, mother? Yeah. And mother superior looks at her and says, go, my daughter. Yeah. And she ascends the steps and she waves aside the assistant who was gonna help her into position because she went down herself, uh, laid in that prone position, which she would have been in on a church floor when she would have pronounced her vows. Uh, she's prone and she's slid underneath the, the yoke of, of the guillotine. All the other sisters are, are singing and the crowd is just waiting with bated breath. It's just unbelievable what, what they're witnessing. And uh, meanwhile, Sister Constance, this youngest sister, she is, she's also singing Psalm 117, all the nations praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. as she's put in position to die. And suddenly the, the blade comes down and there's one less voice singing. And then the next sister comes up and there's one less voice singing. And one less until finally the last voice of, of Mother Teresa of St. Augustine is all that's singing, her lone voice sort of haunting over the crowd. And she and her sisters, you know, Father, they, they specifically were offering up their lives as a sacrifice to God to end this, this the reign of terror during the French Revolution, mm -hmm. to end it, and for the church in France. They were mm -hmm. We know that. We, historians know that from their records and things. And so when she died and all was silent and their bodies were stripped and thrown into a mass grave, 10 days later, the reign of terror ended. Yeah. It ended with the death of Robespierre himself, the man in charge and who'd organized all this. It ended with his execution at the guillotine. Yep. Yeah, this is, um, uh, you know, where the, the, on one hand, Carmelites epitomize the retreat from the world. Yeah. And on the other hand, these martyrs engage this spiritual war yeah. head on. And from the secular view, the government won by killing them. That's right. From our spiritual view, they are the martyrs wearing the crown of martyrdom and carrying the palm of victory as martyrs. Yeah. And that's how we depict them. Yeah. I think this is, uh, my, and, and just so folks know, there's an opera about these sisters and their martyrdom. 
none, uh, no, no opera is out there praising Robespierre, as far as I know. <laughs> He's the <laughs> big right. loser. He, he was. Yeah, and this, you're right. The sisters, their, their spiritual retreat and their, their community, uh, their, sister, their sisterly love for each other and for Christ, is what gave them the strength to walk into the very jaws of conflict at the beginning of, of the book and try to set up the stage for understanding what this conflict was about in the, in the 18th century. And, you know, we, today we have folks who, with certain good sense, talk about making a retreat in the face of our contemporary world. Uh, Rod yeah. Dreher is a good example when he, in a book that he wrote called The Benedict Option. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have to be as subtle as I think your book is in recognizing that we are in different kinds of relationship with the modern world. We yeah, have to stand exactly in conflict with the forces of death. Yeah. Uh, it may not be Robespierre with a guillotine, but it's plenty of politicians, some of whom, like Robespierre, are raised Catholic, yeah. but are pushing for abortion and euthanasia. Yeah. And are just as deadly to children in the womb or to the elderly sick as Robespierre was to his enemies. That's right. And we have to engage that in the yep. conflict. But then That's there right. are other things in the modern world, our concern for the poor, our concern for and making sure that slavery ends. Uh, uh, lots of engagement that we can do and should do, yep. and also intellectually. Yeah. As well as, in some cases, there's not much we can do, and retreat is the best option. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. I think you, you know the Benedict option, uh, you know, one amazing idea and contribution, sure, to the discussion for sure. Um, I think my response would be I would share with um, Bishop Robert Barron said uh, of that book one time. He said he said, um, "Do we need a Benedict option? Yes, but we should also be deft enough." He said in reading the signs of the times, and spiritually nimble enough to shift when necessary to a more open and engaging attitude, unquote, I would add, and also conflict attitude uh, when needed. But that mm -hmm. phrase spiritually nimble is wonderful, I think, of, of Barron's, that we need to know there's different people with different vocations, for one thing. Mm -hmm. there, you, mm -hmm. have, you, have pol you have Catholic politicians and lawyers and doctors. I mean, Benedict Option, are you kidding me? I mean, they're on the front lines getting blasted with, you know, the machine guns of the modern world. I mean, they, they're in a conflict over the dignity of life, and they've got to fight for it. And we've yep. got to pray for them, and we've got to support them, and they, and they need to be affirmed in their vocation. Because if they don't fight for it, then the next thing that will happen is that, I mean, we won't be able to have retreat either. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, I think uh, th this is a, a very important uh, element. There are a lot of folks uh, who are in this, uh, this conflict. I mean, we see that a, a cancel culture has developed, and they're fighting against anybody with ideas different than those of left-leaning progress. But yeah. we, we have to engage what the ideas actually are, yeah. understand them, and, and when necessary, you know, and engage in the conflict. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, one of the leading reasons that young people leave the church is they, they, they get a sense or they get a feeling from their schooling or whatever that science and religion are somehow at odds with each other. Yes. And that's a tragedy. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's, a tra it's a tragedy that's happening because of the failure of Catholics to engage intellectually, not just with the sciences, but with modern world and modern thought in, in general. And it's yeah. so important for the young generation to see the elders doing that yep. and, and realizing that 
just a conflictual mentality is it's not enough. It, it, it actually, without the others, it starts to mutate and Catholics start to turn inward on themselves. And you see this online constantly. You get one kind of Catholic saying, you're not really Catholic. And they start arguing over, you know, who, what's a better way to be a Catholic? And they start tearing themselves apart. That happened in the 18th century too, between Jesuits and Jansenists and other, and other kinds of groups at the time. And it was a disaster. In the 18th yep. century, it meant Catholics were, were so disunited in France that it meant that this conflict got out of hand and, and the secularists won, at least in France. Yep. So we can't let that happen today. We, we can't be constantly conflicting. And one way to avoid that, of course, is through the ret retreat and the wisdom we gain from retreat, but also through this engagement, engaging intellectually, trying to understand mm -hmm. the other people where they're at and realizing that intellectually – um, there's a lot of common ground we can have with uh, obviously other Catholics, but even outside the church, other Christians, the Judeo-Christian tradition, even secularists who care about the common good. We need to be engaged in those conversations. Yeah, it's uh, I try to emphasize uh, and teach often that uh, while the television comedy series Big Bang Theory it has its leading character as anti-religion and atheistic. They never mention that the person who discovered the Big Bang Theory in real life was a Catholic yeah. priest. That's right. And <laughs> the, the founder of genetics was an Austrian Catholic priest. I, the, these are important things and that our schools have traditionally had good science I'm, I'm sure the good science um, uh, department over at the University of Mary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and this is a very important thing to have. So we, we want to have that engagement as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me uh, just mention again, because we're getting close to the end here. And I want to mention that your book is called Rethinking the Enlightenment Faith in the Age of Reason. This is by Dr. Joseph T. Stewart. And it's available at EWTNRC.com. It's item number 8227. The, the, he tells the story well. And I like the way that you especially told the story of the Carmelites of Compiègne and the rest of the ideas. But it's very engaging and uh, it's very accessible. So I urge folks to, to, to get that. Thank you. Dr. Stewart, uh, I want to thank you for being with us, taking time. Um, you're, you're a young professor. You got to do all the stuff you have to do to prepare classes. So thank you for being with us. And may the Lord bless you and all of our viewers to find that engagement with our world, to stand up bravely to, in conflict where we have to, and to take time to retreat to know God. May this God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank and you so we much. ask all of you to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll continue to have great guests and pay our bills too. Thank you. <laughs>